While we don't find out the details until Season 3, the Marley and Eldian conflict is both in a narrative sense and a thematic sense the central underlying conflict of the series. And you can see this going back even to the beginning of Season 1, where the original famous opening song, the lyrics in English are, Are You the Prey or Are You the Hunter? And that's a constant theme throughout Attack on Titan, is the idea of power relations. Who is the prey, who is the hunter? And in terms of Marley and Eldia, you have this balance of power that keeps going one way or the other. Sometimes the Eldian Empire is the hunter and Marley is the prey. Sometimes um, Marley is the hunter and Eldia is the prey. And I think another aspect of it that makes Attack on Titan different from a lot of forms of media is in modern society, there's often this idea that just because a group is weaker or oppressed, that gives them a certain sense of inherent moral superiority. That somehow being oppressed makes them a more righteous, a more good, a more moral people, regardless of their actual behavior. And I think in Attack on Titan, you really don't see this. Uh, the parody we see at the beginning of the series is corrupt, brutal, riddled with horrendous crimes, slavery, a, a disinterested monarchy, a corrupt military that victimizes the public. It really doesn't seem like the kind of society we're saving. This is despite the fact they live under constant oppression and terror from the Titans. Likewise, the Marlians start off the timeline as we know it as being this oppressed and slave people by the Eldian Empire. But immediately after they get out, out from under their thumb, they become this extremely imperialistic, jingoistic, presumably genocidal regime that enslaves and destroys all other countries that it can get across and replaces them with its own colonists. So Marley's period of oppression basically taught them nothing from a virtue standpoint, and they're as bad, if not worse, than their former masters. It really is, I think, a more accurate portrayal in a lot of ways in terms of how international relations work, at least from a realist perspective, where it is to a certain extent a zero-sum game. And while morality may exist in kind of an abstract religious sense, the there is a, a sense of competing goods. That is, it's good to act in your country's self-interest. It's good for you, you to want your people to be prosperous, to be free, to be powerful, to be independent. But that, that desire will often directly conflict with other people's desires for the same. The competing demands of the Eldian and Marlian nationalists are inherently at odds with each other. And there is kind of an unreconcilable difference between them. And the conflict will more or less only end if something underlying changes or one side decisively wins. I know in the English dub, they even refer to it as the Eldian question and the final solution to the Eldian question. But before we can get into the series, let's take a look at what happened in the past. And we're just going to go through the history of the conflict and say, who was right? Who was wrong? Is there any real moral difference between the two parties? So let's start with prehistory or back in the murky sands of time before we really know objectively what happened because a lot of attack on titan we either see happen at the present or we see the long-term results of something that happened in the immediate past like we don't see marley conquer all of its territory but from what we can see in the show it's pretty clear that they're an imperialistic power who's been conquering through the liberal use of titans and military force the founding of the Eldian Empire, though, is very much shrouded in mystery, and we have two completely different narratives of it, one from the Eldians and one from the Marlians. Now, the Eldian narrative is that they were this Promethean group who, yes, they conquered a lot of the world, but they found these peoples in an extremely primitive state and they uplifted them. They taught them how to read and write, they taught them science, they taught them how to build cities, metalwork, all this other stuff and that the Marlians were basically swinging in trees before Eldia conquered them. Now, on its face, this sounds like any founding myth. This sounds like any attempt to justify the exploitation and subjugation of another people. And we have to ask the question, is there any actual historical precedent for something like this? And frankly, there very much is. 
if we look at Europe, the Roman Empire subjugated and colonized the vast majority of it. They subsumed the local population culturally to a certain extent, uh, ethnically, religiously, and economically into kind of the greater Roman world. And if you look throughout Europe, generally speaking, most of the areas of the former Roman Empire are very nostalgic towards it. I remember when I was in Spain, the narrative was almost entirely pro-Roman. It viewed pre-Roman Spain as being this primitive kind of backwater of Europe. But when the Romans came, they showed them how to build aqueducts. They taught them reading and writing. Spain immensely developed at the time. And it was viewed as a very positive time period. And you can see in terms of like the architecture and the aesthetics that Roman aesthetics have persisted a long time. I mean, you have Napoleon founding the consulate and then the empire in um, an attempt to imitate Rome. You have all these different countries claiming to be the third Rome, claiming to be the heirs to it. And there is this ongoing nostalgia that that was the time when Europe was united behind one culture, one emperor, and eventually one faith. While this is probably a more controversial example, it can be argued that Chinese civilization did positively benefit a lot of the other East Asian peoples. That well, a lot of Japanese, Korean, and Vietnamese culture, if I understand it properly, came from the imitation of China. Uh, some of the characters and forms of writing they use, a lot of the inventions, the style of government, religion, culture, a lot of these things came from the imitation of China. And even if it did eventually come to the point where a lot of these countries got into fights with China periodically, I think there is still an understanding that there is this ancient cultural debt there. Um, another example you might say is for some Muslim countries, there's some nostalgia for the caliphates and how it kind of brought them to God and that kind of thing. And briefly, all the world's Muslims were kind of united. So it's not as if there's no historical precedent for something like this happening. It is quite possible that the Marlians were subsumed into the growing Eldian Empire, and while they were second-class citizens, their position was still much, much better than it had been previously. We don't really know. There's no way of really determining this. It's kind of a he said, she said thing. Both sides have a lot of incentive to use propaganda. Now, the Marlian perspective is that they were completely destroyed and subjugated by the Eldians, and it was just this extremely brutal, um, they, they lived in total slavery, their treatment was horrendous, all this sort of thing. So once again, we can't really say for certain. On the surface, because the narrative, at least today, tends to be more that whenever a country becomes subject to another country, it's inherently a bad thing. Historically, I don't really think you can say that's the case. So I'm going to say at the outset, they are. there's not really much we can say. Now we get to the end of the Eldian Empire, which frankly is very confusing. But from my understanding, a civil war broke out and the Eldian emperors encouraged the civil war and deliberately sabotaged it because they wanted the Eldian Empire to collapse, because they felt immense guilt over the crimes that Eldia had committed against the people of Marley. And they wanted Marley to basically be their successor civilization. They wanted their people to be exterminated. And so they gave all but two of the Titans, those being the Attack Titan and the Founding Titan, to the Marlians, took as many Eldians as they could, and fled to Madagascar, aka Parody, where they built the walls to protect themselves and they made the vague threat of mutually assured destruction, or rather, they preserved their weapons of mass destruction, aka the rumbling, with the promise that if, El if Marley ever violated the peace treaty, even if it wasn't maybe a formal peace treaty, they would unleash it and basically annihilate Marley and completely wipe them off the map. So I would say that there is very much, even if it is... Marley didn't have a government at the time, and there wasn't like a prime minister to sign a treaty with the King Fritz or whatever. I think there very much was an agreement that Marley would be left the entirety of the mainland. Uh, they'd be left the 
control over the uh, other uh, some of the Titans and be allowed to do whatever they wanted, provided that they leave Parody alone, which they didn't at all. And they immediately began to screw with them. But we'll get to that in a minute. So I kind of think that that is the moral event horizon of the series where Eldia decided unilaterally to give the Marlians everything that they could ever want and more and asked for basically just a colony that seems to have no ethnic Marlians on it to just live in peace on. And that was probably about the best that we could we could hope for in terms of a resolution. Now, kind of the big thing, which was the Eldian question, is all the Eldians who are left living in Marley. Now, Marlians can't inherit the power of the Titans, and they can't transform into pure Titans, so the Marlian Empire's rapid expansion was entirely based upon using Eldians, their previous mortal enemies, as conscripts. It kind of reminds me a bit of how, what the Ottoman Empire did with uh, Christian subjects, recruiting them from birth and using them as its elite soldiers. Now, there is kind of a historical precedent to this. If you look at the Varankian Guard or the Imperial German Bodyguard or the Swiss Guard or stuff like that, it can't be useful if you're a ruler to have a, like the Praetorian Guard of your regime, be from some sort of foreigner. Because on one hand, they are inherently above local politics. You can't have, like, if the, the, the kings of France Swiss Guard had done a palace coup and taken power, no one would have followed them. Their fate would have basically been sealed and they would have been massacred. And that was kind of one of the useful things about the Varangian Guard or the Imperial German Bodyguard is that they were the members of this hated minority and they owed their existence entirely to the emperor. And they had no ability to carve out their own power base. Now, in the context of Marley, what all also makes it good is the Marlian warriors can also be seen as traitors to their people. So they can't really go back and lead some sort of Eldian uprising because the Eldians are going to see them as filthy traitors who sided with their oppressors. So they're basically between a rock and a hard place and they have to serve the Marlian state completely faithfully or else they're going to get screwed one way or another. So kind of back to the main plot line, almost immediately after um, Eldia went to parody and the royal family brainwashed everyone into thinking that they were the last remnant of humanity, Marley violated the truce by taking Eldians, bringing them to parody, injecting them with Titan serum and leaving them to wander around the wilderness, completely boxing the Eldians in. Uh, probably the idea was eventually that the pure titans would kill the remaining Eldians and destroy the last free Eldian society. Now, once again, there's two ways to look at this. You can see this as purely a revenge punishment as a way to torment them and to hurt them. Or you can see it as an attempt to exterminate them in the long term. But like I said, I think this is where you have the moral event horizon where things start to switch towards Eldia because the Marlians, in my view, violated a very strict, sacred international treaty. The other aspect of it is the Marlians were overly reliant upon their uh, titans for their warfare and their military technology, military organization, and that sort of thing is lagging behind those of their rivals. Titans aren't the super weapon they used to be, and we can see this in their war with the Middle Eastern Alliance. Advancements in uh, artillery and small arms and tanks and fortifications and stuff have made it extremely difficult to have the same level of advantage Titans used to have. They still are somewhat superior to their opponents, and Marley's going to probably have to start turning to conscription and weapons development and that sort of thing which it probably can given its immense size, but that also raises the question of how much of Marlian's empire are non-Marlians or regions that are only kept in th awe of the central government by the power of the Titans. And so we get once again to kind of the security dilemma or the dilemma of countries acting in their own self-interest. So Marley correctly views itself as being in a very precarious position and the only real choice that they have, which I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with, but they perceive as the only real choice they have, 
is to go to Parody Island, get the founding Titan, and use its godlike powers to reverse the situation to ensure that Titans will be powerful enough to continue to function for the foreseeable future and allow them to transition to a more traditional military power to get their technology caught up, to build a professional army large enough to defeat all of their opponents. And this leads to Operation Parody Island, where they send a number of their warriors there with the idea of infiltrating it and getting the founding Titan. Now, from my understanding, I'm somewhat confused as to whether breaking through Mar Mal Maria, Wall Maria and Wall Rose was specifically an act of genocide to try to exterminate the remaining Eldians, or if it was just a side effect of their infiltration plan, like they needed to do that so they could get further in and their status as refugees covered up. Uh, all the holes in their paperwork or something like that. I don't really know. But once again, I see this as Marley clearly breaking a de facto truce and forcing Eldia into a corner. Once again, though, there's the whole who is the prey and who is the hunter thing. You have a brief kind of reversal of this once you develop the, I forget what they call it, the hell executioner thing that provides a safe way of killing pure titans. The Titans go from being the Hunters to being the Hunted. Uh, the Eldians rediscover their heritage after beating the uh, Marleyan warriors off. Uh, Marley uses probably its biggest military asset in the Colossal Titan, with its ability to function as a literal tactical nuke. They also lose the female Titan, which triggers the war with the Mideast Union, which obviously Marley wins, but they're severely weakened as a result. It's a bit like the Winter War or Vietnam or Afghanistan or something like that, where they won, but they did way worse than they should have relative to their opponents. It was like a mess. It was a debacle. The Soviet Union beat Finland in the end, but it really should have just been able to curb stomp them in five seconds flat. America was able to defeat the North Vietnamese invasions a number of different times, but they really should have been able to land some sort of knockout blow. And immediately after they left, everything just completely fell apart. Marley also has the issue after this where because of their actions, uh, it, it's it's entirely self-inflicted because if they hadn't have been exiling uh Eldian restorationist to uh, parody, then Grisha Jaeger never would have come there and he never would have revealed everything to the residents there and they would have re -under re discovered their Eldian heritage. So, as a result of all of that, they figure uh, the Eldians figure out how to use the founding Titan. They don't really have an exact way of doing it, but they figure out that the walls are made of the colossal Titans and that they have a super weapon. They have a weapon that can destroy basically everywhere else on Earth in the form of the rumbling. Now, for those of you who don't know what the rumbling is, the walls and attack on Titan are made up of tens of thousands. I'm not sure if it's hundreds of thousands of colossal Titans. And the founding Titan, with its ability to control them, can cause them to just rampage across the world, destroying everything in their path which will basically exterminate all life outside of uh, parody. And if they want, I guess they can go and reoccupy the rest of the world. But the idea was it was there in case Marley violated the truce. So Marley is now in a position where its opponents have the means to completely and utterly annihilate them. And they'll probably eventually figure out how to use it. And once again, it looks like the situation has reversed itself. Eldia is now in the position of being the hunter. It's rapidly industrializing and modernizing. Sure, Marley has many times the population, but they have to get to parity. And as long as they have the Colossal Titan, then it's going to be very difficult for any kind of navy to get there. And eventually they resort to airships, but that's kind of a side issue. You also have the Jaegerists, or the ultra-nationalists in Eldia, who actively are advocating for the use of the rumbling and the reconquest of the mainland as a form of getting revenge. And once again, you do have this cycle of revenge where it goes back and forth, 
where whatever fa- whatever side has more power at that particular moment wants to get revenge for the wrongs that were committed against it. And this leads to Aaron, uh, Aaron Yeager's raid, which sets off the events of season four. Now, some people will compare this to Pearl Harbor. I don't think it's similar to Pearl Harbor at all, because if you look at the situation, Aaron attacks a conference where all the nations of the world have come together to discuss the final solution to the Eldian question, and he attacks literally after they declare a genocidal war on, El- on um, parody with the intention of invading the island, slaughtering everybody there, ethnically cleansing it, and wiping them out. So Pearl Harbor, the, the issue with that is it was done prior to a declaration of war. It was a sneak attack. In this case, the Eldia literally attacked after the declaration of war was made, and they didn't even make the declaration of war. It wasn't one of these lame things where they attack and the declaration of war was in the mail and it arrived too late. It was literally after their opponents declared a genocidal war against them. And I think it tactically and strategically did make a lot of sense because they were at a massive disadvantage in terms of material, manpower, that sort of thing. And Aaron's offensive succeeded in killing most of the Marley and High Command. They captured the Warhammer Titan. They captured Zeke. And Armin managed to destroy most of the Marley and Navy, which was the main way that they were going to invade Parody. So while it did start off the, uh, a world war and it did unite the world against them, I mean, it's it's like, OK, so they were going to declare they they had declared a genocidal world war against parody. But now they're going to declare a worse genocidal war against parody. Like, like, who even cares at this point? Uh, he saw a very good tactical strategic opportunity and he took it. It probably buyed buyed parody some time to build up their forces and to continue to modernize. And so this kind of brings us to the end of the series. Now, obviously, season four, part two is not out yet. So I I haven't I don't know everything that happens. But from my understanding, we have a couple different um, methods presented to how to finally resolve this situation. Obviously, there's the Marleyan way where they exterminate um, parody. They take the founding Titan. They use its power to reestablish control over everything maybe they kill off all the non-marleans and then once their rules established maybe they exterminate the remaining eldians so that's their idea is to basically get the founding titan wipe out the world and completely colonize it all for marley the second solution which is the one that zeke has is he's going to use the power of the Founding Titan to sterilize all the Eldians throughout the world. So they'll hopefully live peaceful lives, but they won't be able to have children. And when the last one of them dies off, there will be no remaining host for the Titans, and the power of the Titans will pass out of the world. And no one will ever be able to use it uh, for destructive purposes again. Now, once again, I really dislike Zeke. I think he's a traitor. I think he's a scumbag, but I can kind of see where he's coming from. There's not a lot of other ways to resolve this whole thing without there being more conflict and more death and more destruction. Then you have the Jaegerist Aaron way of resolving it, which is to use the Founding Titan to start the rumbling and to permanently destroy all threats to uh, Eldia and basically just create a world of just Eldians. Um, I think part of that would include destroying, killing all the Eldians on the mainland. But at this point, it's very much, are you going to be the prey or are you going to be the hunter? Is is Parody going to unleash its super weapon and destroy the people who are trying to destroy it? Or is it going to allow itself to just be completely wiped out, completely destroyed, lying down? And like I said, that kind of brings us to this situation where you have both sides acting in their self-interest in a way that's unreconcilable. Parody is too dangerous at this point to leave alone because they can unleash the rumbling, at least the Marleans believe they can unleash the rumbling at any time and destroy the entire world. And Parody is facing off against an enemy they can never hope to match in terms of conventional might. And they have a super weapon and it's really the only move left. So you have two people who each have one card left to play, 
and there's really no way to de-escalate the situation. And so this kind of brings us to the, the ultimate question that we started this video out with, is one side more right, is one side more wrong? Now, I tend to sympathize more with the Eldians because, on parody at least, they were reasonably content to stay there as a hermit kingdom, to be isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, the, the kings had more or less put a system in place that prevented the rumbling from ever actually being used. And if Marley hadn't have done all the ops and, like, put the, the pure titans on the island and breached Wall Maria and done all this other stuff, the situation might have just continued like that indefinitely. The royal government was preventing the development of any kind of technology that would have allowed Eldia to come to terms with the rest of the world. Now, my understanding, and I don't know how actually if that was in the manga or the anime, but Eldia is also like a massive oil fossil fuels, uh, or parody rather is, and they wanted to get those. That kind of seems like weak sauce to me, though. But I think Marley broke the truce first, and they kind of continued to double down and triple down on the whole thing. And it very much, like I said, Grisha Jaeger never would have come there. I don't even know if the Marleans, sorry, the Eldians on the mainland know where Parody is or how to get there. Um, they could have just maintained a quarantine of it and things would have just gone along. I mean, it'd been a hundred years at this point of them trying to provoke Eldia. If Eldia was going to unleash the rumbling, they would have done it by now. It's pretty obvious where all the pure titans were coming from. But ultimately, it kind of comes down to who you personally empathize with more. I mean, we empathize with the Eldians more just because we've been following them for longer. We've seen their struggles. We've seen their desire for freedom. We've seen them be basically dragged through the dirt by Marley. Also, the other peoples of the world dragged through the dirt by Marley. But once again, does that give them an inherent kind of moral superiority solely by the virtue of them being the prey and the issue is it doesn't really so i know i started this off by saying i was going to maybe pick a side but it is difficult to pick a side and that is kind of what you get into when you start to talk about international relations and you start to look at how countries behave the way they do now there i'm not saying there aren't good guys and bad guys and there aren't just and unjust wars or more just and less just wars but you have to look at it from the perspective of the relative participants. If we look at World War II, for instance, from the German perspective, they were in a position where they were always going to be subordinate to countries that hated them, to countries who could cut off their oil supplies and destroy their economy and society at any given time. And they felt that they were trapped and that the only way to get past it was to break out defeat all their enemies who had kind of subjected them to the current situation and reach the Caucasus oil field so that they could become self-sufficient and they could become strong enough to face off against the British and um, their other enemies. Japan felt likewise. They believed that, once again, because the home islands were not self-sufficient, they had to undertake a massive campaign of conquest and build their own colonial empire to fulfill the resource shortages because they were afraid that the Western countries could just cut off trade at any particular time. And then you get into stuff like the creation of Belgium and Britain's guarantee of independence of Belgium, where Britain, from just a geopolitical perspective, can't allow a great power to control that piece of land because it's so strategically important and it's so close to Britain proper it is a buffer state between Germany, France, England, and back when it was more powerful, the Netherlands. And so I guess the answer, who is right, Eldia or Marley, is uh, both sides are just trying to act in their self-interest. For the vast majority of the series, Marley is definitively morally worse on pretty much every level. But they do have an understandable concern that their opponents possess a super weapon that can destroy all life on Earth basically overnight if they ever figure out how to use it properly. And they don't know that they don't know how to use it. And so there really is no solution. It can't be like in real life uh, where the two sides can come to some sort of longer term peace agreement 
or they can develop trade ties as an attempt to create some sort of mutual dependency, or there can be some sort of international community that's actively trying to work for peace. None of this is possible given the super weapon nature of the rumbling. But once again, if Eldia was to give up the rumbling, they could immediately be overrun and destroyed in the matter of months. So that's kind of my geopolitical analysis of Attack on Titan. Uh, it's a series I've really come to appreciate for being very deep and kind of being like, as realistic in terms of how people act as a show about giant monsters can be. But I hope you enjoyed the video. God bless, and I'll talk to you all real soon.